Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is TV personality Kristen Doty. You may recognize Kristen from her longtime role on Vanderpump Rules or perhaps from her content online. Kristen's role in the show came to an end a few years ago, and today she shares her story and reveals a side of her that you may not be as familiar with. We talk about reality TV, cancel culture, dating, mental health, and so much more. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Kristen Doty to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thank you for having me. I'm very stoked. Yes, I'm excited to, to talk to you too. I mean, based on our conversation the other day, we talked for almost two hours and I was like, man, I'm I'm so looking forward to like digging into your backstory, talking about your comeback after being canceled and just like what you're up to now. But I think a good place for us to start for some of my audience who might not be familiar with you or even the show is to take me back because one of the things we connected on is that you actually worked at a restaurant that I would go to when I was younger. You worked at, at Secrets in Ocean City. So talk about like where you were at at that point in your life. How old were you? And then like how did that progress into you moving out to LA to pursue the entertainment industry? So I left Michigan. I'm from Michigan originally. And I left Michigan at 22 years old, followed a boy to Ocean City, Maryland, good old DJ at the Tiki Hut on the beach. And at that point in my life, I had gone to college for just like a few semesters. I was kind of lost, not sure what I wanted to do. And I, yeah, I worked at this beach bar sort of place, lived there for maybe like six or seven months, moved to Miami for roughly the same period of time. It's what they call in the modeling world, like a season. So I was modeling down there when I was like 22, 23. And the next year I kind of just felt like there was not a lot of opportunity for me in Michigan. I knew that I wanted to entertain at the time I wanted to be in the music business and I, I've been in theater my whole life. So I thought about acting, but I just knew like, I really wanted to go out West. So when I was 24, I just sort of moved to LA on a whim. I had one friend here and I immediately, I had a modeling agent who told me you are not going to be like paying your bills right off the bat. So you need to have a quote unquote regular job. And at that time I was thinking, you know, I've watched, the Hills or like the, that was like the first like reality show I remember. And I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be a bottle service girl at this SBE club type place. And I'm going to make thousands and thousands of dollars a night. And it was just not realistic. And my agent got me a serving and bartending job at Sir restaurant, which at the time there was no housewives of Beverly Hills. There was no anything. It was a very small restaurant. And I worked there for, I forget a few years before Housewives of Beverly Hills became a thing. And then it was just sort of the wildness that came with the, the staff at Sir around that time, which would have been 2011 is when we shot the pilot for Vanderpump. And essentially Bravo came to us. So rather than, I don't know if people understand like sort of how pitching a show goes in this world, this crazy world of Los Angeles entertainment, but typically you don't have a network coming to you saying, we really want this show. So here's some money and like film it. Let me see a sizzle reel. And that's essentially what happened. And it was just myself, my two best friends. We were all dating three guys that were best friends. And they said, let's just follow you around with the camera and, you know, see what sticks. And it stuck. I definitely, when I started working on Vanderpump, like I remember my boyfriend, Tom Sandoval and I, who's still a cast member on the show, we were thinking like, oh, this is going to ruin our budding acting career. Like we can't possibly do trash TV and eventually convinced ourselves that, hey, we try one season. If it doesn't go well, no one's ever going to hear about it. It won't even matter. And if it does well, maybe this could be a platform to, you know, boost whatever we want to do next. So I will say, you know, even in hindsight, the one thing I'm super grateful for being on Vanderpump Rules and just being given that platform was like all the opportunities that it awarded me at the time. Right. Wow. It's such a crazy journey, I guess, for a few reasons. One, it seems like you bounced around a bit before moving to LA and then you come to LA to kind of pursue like something in the entertainment industry, but you didn't think it was going to be reality TV. Then you get on reality TV and it ends up being the thing that ends up building your brand and, and really building your career in a meaningful way. So who else 
was part of the original cast? Like, who were the the starting members of Vanderpump? Yeah, the starting members were uh, myself, Stassi, Schroeder, Katie Maloney, and then Tom Sandoval, Jax Taylor, and Sheena Shea. And then Tom Schwartz got brought on, Ariana Maddox got brought on. And that was kind of really early. And there was a guy, Peter, who's amazing. He's the manager at Sir. Not quite as dramatic as the rest of us, so he kind of stays in the shadows a bit. But that's been the core cast for, I would say, half of the series. And then as of late, I don't, they're just trying to keep the brand going, I guess. <laughs> and so this, this, you started like filming for that like back in 2011? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2011, we shot the pilot. And then 2012, we were filming it aired in 2013. So I was on I filmed that show for almost a decade, about nine years, like basically my entire adult life. It's kind of speaking of like, you know, when I got canceled, it was just it was such a shock because I was like, well, what do we do? Like, I wasn't ready. None of us we were all kind of getting ready to do a spinoff. And I can say that confidently now because of some of my other cast members have already said this publicly, but um, the very, in 2020, before the pandemic hit and right around the time our season was coming to an end filming, like we were filming our reunions in 2020, we had already been in talks that we were going to have a spinoff about all of us that were living in the Valley and kind of had houses and marriages and babies and just kind of what's the next step for this core cast and yeah, that kind of all just fell to shit when everything went down. So I really did think that this could keep going because of the new show we were in discussions about. And I definitely want to get into all of what you just talked about as far as like being canceled and how that kind of shattered everything for you at that point in your life. But I guess what I'd like to know first is you talked about like reality TV being trash TV. And that's something that I would say a lot of people think of reality TV as trash TV, just something that they're going to go and they're going to watch a bunch of drama, watch a bunch of people gossiping about each other and fighting and this and that. And I think that sometimes people develop this perception of what reality TV is. And they think that everything on reality TV is real because it's called reality television. You've been on reality TV. You've been on the other side where you've watched reality TV. You've been in production stuff. Like how real is reality TV? I mean, I could probably speak for a lot of different shows and I'll just speak for the show that I was on. The first season, they were definitely flies on a well where they kind of just followed us around to see, like I said earlier, like what would stick because they didn't really know any of us. They didn't know what they could get from us. But then from there, I think what I want people to really understand, and I don't want to take away the magic of what the show or any of these shows are, but they're very much reality series and not a docu-series. And there's a huge difference between like a documentary style show versus, I don't like to call it scripted because I'm not handed a script the way I was when you know I was doing acting, but it's a very manufactured, very well-produced, very well-oiled machine. And with that comes a narrative of the character that you become. So you're no longer a three-dimensional human being. You are a now one-dimensional human being. And if that you just don't get to see all the sides of everybody, you get to see, yeah, maybe I think you and I talked about this, like maybe 10% of who we are. So essentially, you know, I created that part of that character myself when I was in my late twenties. However, as time goes on and I want to change and I want to grow and I'm like deep diving into therapy and I'm getting out of toxic relationships, that narrative wasn't something that Bravo wanted for me personally. So it's like, I think that's what frustrated me the most again with the cancellation was like, okay, Bravo. So you wanted me to stir the pot, insert myself in things that were you know, not my business to do. And the second that I wanted to grow from that and evolve, that wasn't interesting anymore. They, don't, they just don't want that from me personally or from a lot of people because they want the drama and the drink throwing and the cheating scandals and the fights. And it really frustrated me that they were allowed access into my life at some of my worst times. And they were then given the access to allow the viewers to be in my life at those worst times. But when it came down to this network that I had such a close relationship with for almost a decade, when I really needed them the most, they just sort of dropped the ball. 
And I think that was the most frustrating part. And also, you know, again, like given the platform to build brands and things like that. And that's essentially why I wrote my book. He's making you crazy because I'm like, well, if you know, I have to lean into this for a minute. I knew how to do my job after a few years. It was frustrating, but I understood the assignment. And at that point, it became just a job for me rather than trying to prove myself on camera because I knew that they were never going to show that. So did you find yourself like morphing into the Kristen character from the show and distancing yourself from who you truly were like at your core? Or did you feel like you could tell that you were portraying a different version of yourself on the show? In the last few seasons, like I said, I mean, I, I'm such an empath. I care so much about my friends. I'm very, very loyal. I do think, I think it's like a strong suit of mine where it's positive and negative that I do think I can like fix things for people. So if like my friends are in a fight or there's like a couple getting an argument, like I just want to make it right. Like, let me help you through with my therapy tools. So there is that part of me that has been that person who's like inserted myself or sort of quote unquote stirred the pot, but it was never in a malicious way, but that just wasn't interesting to them. So it was much more interesting to be malicious. And so, yeah, toward the end in the last few seasons, I was definitely guided by producers say this, do that. You know how to make a show Think in your producer brain, what looks good for TV And I sort of became numb to the trolls online and a little bit numb to like all of the hate because I started really, especially in the last, I would say maybe two years, like I really started understanding like my sense of self and my self-love. So I kind of was able to turn it on and off and fight with my friends on camera and then go to lunch after and be like, oh, we did a good job. That was a great scene, guys, you know, but it, you know, it doesn't change that it's a little bit difficult when you're perceived that way because you don't want to ruin the magic of what is television. So you mentioned that it started out as this fly on the wall approach where they were just following you and your friends around and it was super organic that you were being yourselves. Like how did they dictate where it would go from there? Like how did they know like, all right, like we need more scandals, we need more drama. Like how would they base what you guys were doing on? I mean, that's the beauty of having a showrunner who's a really seasoned smart executive producer because I personally wouldn't know what all of my friends were filming without me. I know what my, I think this is something also like if I can just like kind of peel back the curtain and let people into what reality TV looks like. It's not that we're just, I made plans with Lala and I'm showing up at a bar or a restaurant and then the cameras are like, okay, we'll follow you there. I mean, it's a schedule. It's call times. We have multiple crews, you know, camera guys, sound guys, producers, field producers. And so it's all very scheduled out and you don't necessarily know what content you're going to be filming when you go to said call time. So a call time looks like, you know, 3 PM at sir. And you may or may not know who you're filming with. They could totally just throw a wrench in and really mess with you by having someone just show up unannounced, at least to me or to another cast member. So really it's like the producers that sit in this office and have this big whiteboard and, you know, this storyline arc that they're figuring out as we film, they start sort of figuring out what is the the beginning, what could the end be and what is our climax? And then it's just like writing, you know, writing a story, writing a book, a fiction book. So they kind of figure that all out based on what is going on in our real lives, but then what's going to be more interesting to add on to that. Because if we all are adults and can hug it out at the end of the day, that's so boring, even though that's real life. It's almost like a modern day soap opera, right? Where they want to leave you on your toes. They want to have like cliffhangers. They want to drive views because if, if everything were normal, like nobody would watch it, right? Because as human beings, we are like addicted and we crave like excitement, right? We crave like the next thing. Yeah, adrenaline. Yeah, it's like an adrenaline rush. Things that make your heart beat faster, you know, whatever that looks like. I always say like the way Vanderpump started was, so Fleetwood Mac is my favorite band. And I always say Vanderpump Rules is like the Fleetwood Mac of reality television where everyone fucks and fights. But at the end of the day, we're all family. And that's really the truth of who we were and like what this family friendship looks like with the core cast. 
but then it was like, okay, that, that wasn't good. That was good for like a year or two. So now you're the soap opera. We need to write in those bigger moments to make it juicier. What are some of the parts of you and, and your personality and some of your greatest gifts that you, f- you feel or you think like weren't displayed enough on the show so that if somebody's listening to this or they're watching this that maybe saw you on the show and only saw that 10%, like what do you wish they would have shown more of? I think what frustrated me the most when people would call me a mean girl, like the viewers, because there was like a group myself with some of the girls and yeah, we were gossipy, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like the anti-bully. I'm the anti-mean girl. I want peace, love, kindness. I work with my energy healer. I've been with my therapist for eight years. I think a lot of what people saw was a lot of like reaction from me. And I've worked really hard over the last decade to not react, not so impulsively, but that doesn't work for reality TV. And the other thing that doesn't work for reality TV is I don't know and I don't care. So if there's a situation happening that you don't really have an opinion about that doesn't work. So you better stick to one opinion one way or the other. And that's just not how I personally live my life. I like to see all sides to everything. I want to hear how everyone feels. I just feel like I've been through so much in the 39 years that I've been alive that I can truly empathize with even people that I don't get along with. And I think if everyone in this world could just be a bit more empathetic, we'd be in a lot better shape. Right. I think empathy is the key to everything in this world. And I know we talked about that the other day, and I think it's so important for people to to have empathy and to pay attention to how they treat other people because you just never know like what's behind the curtain. And one of the things I want to get into next is I think one of the most triggering and hurtful things you can say to somebody is, is calling them crazy, right? And identifying them as being a crazy person. I know you were kind of portrayed as being crazy Kristen in a way on the show. How did that impact you? How did that impact your mental health? How did that impact the way you behave? Just how did that impact you overall? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning when that was sort of, when that became the narrative, it was because of a cheating scandal with my boyfriend at the time and the girl that, you know, I thought he was cheating on me with, who they've now been together, I think about nine years and they're amazing, but I wasn't wrong. And this was all playing out for me on camera and then having to relive it and watch it and do press about it. So I think that's another thing, like talking about that, but all in reality TV in general is like, if something happens, it's not like in real life where you you can deal with it, handle it, talk it through and move forward. No, you're going to film about it. Then you're going to do pickups of pickups or if people don't know, but like essentially filming months later to sort of fill in the gaps or do those little like interview bobblehead confessional moments will happen months later. And then right before the show airs, you're going to do press about it. And then the show airs and then you have to talk about it some more until it's a year later and now we're jumping back into filming. So I think that's something that's really hard is that they don't give you that opportunity to, to just like, move forward and get past things. But that was a lot of the crazy Kristen was this cheating scandal and obviously just feeding us alcohol. And I was young and I was in a very toxic relationship, but we were both broke and we were like in our twenties. And, you know, you just, for me, that was just something that I did. Like we were, we should have broken up after year two, not year six. But sometimes you just make those mistakes when you're young. And that was essentially the start of Crazy Kristen. And then it was masking. It was a lot of partying on camera, but also like masking my depression and my anxiety with alcohol while I was filming. Like, oh my God, we're about to film. We should do shots. And then you just turn into a sloppy mess. So I think it was a culmination of a lot of that stuff and not dealing with, like at that point in my life, I was not in therapy. And so not really dealing with the, the real, real reality of, of the trauma that it can cause. I just, I'm too empathetic. So I was just feeling way too many feelings and not being able to look at it as a job. Absolutely. And I think that our perception of ourselves can become hijacked based on like the lies we believe with regards to how other people talk to us. And then we start to believe those lies and and actually internalize them and actually think them ourselves as far as our personality and the way we behave. And it kind of plays out into our life. Did you ever like find that with you where you 
kind of talked about the role of being crazy Kristen. Did you like then just really truly believe that you were actually crazy at any point or could you kind of separate the two things in that way? A little bit of both. I mean, no, I knew I wasn't crazy. Like I'm very intelligent. There's a lot of things I really love about myself. And I think that was the most frustrating part is that I couldn't tackle that narrative or like defend it, defend myself against it. However, I think a lot of the relationships that I had with cast members on that show, friends and romantic relationships, at that time, I did not have enough self-love or confidence to realize that just because these things were being said about me, I didn't have to believe them. I didn't have a strong enough sense of self. And so I think that that kind of haunted me and really with my brain and my soul, even my heart until about 2019, which would have been like the last year we did Vanderpump, which was right before I started writing my book is when I realized like, whoa, like this is not the rest of your life. Like these comments and these narratives, and this is not who you are. This does not define you, me, you know? So it is a little bit of both that definitely in the beginning, I was believing what people were saying. I never felt crazy though. No. But then I decided to just take that word back and say, okay, well, what does crazy actually mean? Because I'm passionate, because, you know, I want to know the truth, because, you know, I'm like a truth digger. I stand up for my friends, you know, maybe at the demise of, of myself or my reputation. But at the end of the day, I can lay my head on my pillow knowing that I was a really good person and I can wake up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror. Right. Yeah. Amen to that. And, and speaking of your reputation, we've touched on it a couple of times, but I want to kind of get into it. Like you did get in a way canceled. You were kicked off Vanderpump. Take us back June, 2020. You're kicked off the show. June 9th, 2020. <laughs> How are you feeling? What was going through your mind? Where were you? Who was the first person that you called? Like, give us all the details. Yeah, that was a real doozy, I will say. So obviously, as we all know, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We had filmed our reunion series from home. We had all this equipment dropped off just a couple months prior to that. And the day that I actually got canceled was one week after my book was released. And it was the very last day that our last episode aired from that season. So I woke up in the morning and got a call from my lawyer and he filled me in on the way that Bravo worded it was they're not picking us up. Those of us, including myself, they're just not picking up our option. So they didn't use the word fired, but same thing, a gentler way for them to go about it for themselves. And at that point, it was already all over the internet. Like Bravo had announced it before we even got those phone calls. And the very first person I called was Stassi, my friend who had also been canceled. And we were not even speaking at that point. We had not spoken in months. And I just didn't know how to, I, I just, I feel like I was in shock. Like I was crying, but I also was like very numb and I just knew that like I needed her. So I called her immediately. I knew that she already knew about it. And I just said like, I know that we haven't, you know, been doing well over the last few months, but I like, I have to see you. So I immediately drove to her house. And right when I got there, she told me that she was 10 weeks pregnant <laughs> and nobody really knew yet. So that was horrific. So now I'm in this like rock in a hard place where I sort of like need to cry and commiserate with her and say like, what do we do next? But also like protect, you know, her stress levels. And it was just like, kind of everything just came fucking crashing down. And then I spent the next three weeks in bed, honestly, like showering every three days, drinking way too much wine, taking Xanax, sleeping pills. Just, I didn't, I literally was like the worst rock bottom I've ever been at. And that was for a few weeks. And then I picked myself back up and went to therapy twice a week, talked a lot to my family on the phone. Some family came out to visit me. You know, we did the best that we could being in the beginning in the, of this pandemic where you can't really see anybody. So it was a pretty lonely place to be. I was really grateful that I did have my house. So I did have my backyard and I had my dogs. I had a boyfriend at the time, but 
it was just a pretty dark and lonely place to be. And because I, the me in me <laughs> always feels this need to then defend myself and like speak my piece and explain what happened or just like make people understand that I'm not like a bad human being and that I don't have like malicious intent ever. Nobody wanted to hear my voice then. So I knew that my role was, I actually was listening to your Rachel Hollis interview where she says like, intent over impact, like the difference between the two. And I thought that was like something really powerful that she said, because it didn't matter what my intent was. It was the impact that it had. And I just knew my role in that moment was to just be quiet. Just let, hopefully one day this will fade away. And, you know, now we, here, now we are here two years later, a little over two years later, and I'm still a little nervous about you know, putting myself out there again. I don't know if people want to hear my voice. I want my voice to be heard. Well, thanks for sharing that. I know, like we've talked about off air, how challenging it can be and how hard it can be to open up and talk about something like this, which is kind of delicate and something that you really haven't talked publicly about, which is like how you've managed to bounce back, you know, post cancellation, what that was like, how that impacted you from a mental an emotional level. But also my, with, with my brands too, though. Yeah. I mean, immediately after Bravo, you know, stated that and it started getting picked up by the press. It's like, again, I'm on, I like, like to see both sides to everything, but you know, I started not just myself and my friend Stassi and I, like we were both getting dropped and pub not even just dropped, but publicly denounced by certain like we had a wine line that they just went oh we can't sell it anymore like we love you guys but we just can't and they publicly denounced us and then you have like all these online trolls you know tweeting at or posting on instagram like at brands we've worked with companies that we own and saying like we'll never buy your stuff again if you support these girls if you support Kristen. so i do understand they were kind of in a rock between a rock and a hard place. And we were definitely scapegoats in the beginning of this whole cancel culture. And that was just, yeah, that was probably the hardest part was just having everything that I'd worked my entire adult life, just like ripped away from me in one second over something that I couldn't even address or talk about. There's a couple things I want to unpack with what you just said. I think the first thing that comes to mind is you talked about how you couldn't talk about certain things and you felt it was best or, and you were kind of guided. It was best to remain silent, not really say anything. How has that impacted your ability today to speak up for yourself, to maybe potentially reach out to brands, to stand up for who you are? Like, has that impacted you in any way or have you gotten past yeah, that? I mean, I'm absolutely terrified still. And I'm just working through the trauma of it. And I'm so grateful for therapy. And I think everyone should be in therapy doesn't mean anything's wrong with you, but it's, you know, something to work through. I didn't want to feel sorry for myself, but at the same time, like I have major PTSD in more ways than I even realized. Just, yeah, being afraid to promote anything, being afraid to stand up for what I believe in because people used to want to hear my voice and I just don't know if they do anymore. I mean, at some point, I feel like I'm slowly trickling out of that because I do have a lot to say and I am really passionate about a lot of causes and opinions that I have, but it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, I can't even imagine like how tough it must be or must have been or even is today when you've been like kicked off a show, canceled, and you're being publicly insulted and taken down, brands are firing you publicly and people are trying to get brands to fire you and, and that sort of thing. And to add on to that, though, I think this was just really where Bravo messed up. And I'm not saying that selfishly. I've been thinking about this for over two years. I just think they had such an opportunity to film this, to make it a teachable moment. And I think that's where I, I know under, I understand cancel culture is and can be case by case. So I'm not going to speak on every the heart, like we talked about earlier, the Harvey Wine scene. I'm not defending anything like that, but just the cancel culture as a whole, although it is case by case, I do think there's just so much importance in letting these be teachable moments because otherwise, what are we even doing in this world? Someone makes a mistake or someone makes a mistake currently or, you know, four or five, three years ago, whatever it is. And we just say, go disappear. Just disappear. We don't want to hear from you anymore. Instead of, 
letting them learn and making that a teachable moment so that we all become better. It just blows my mind. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think I'm all about like accountability and taking ownership and responsibility. And on the other hand, I'm not I'm not about just completely like wiping somebody off the internet because of a mistake, a mistake that they made, you know, especially like if it wasn't in a way that wasn't like like violent. Like we talked about like you, you mentioned Harvey Weinstein I and mean, we were not talking about that. We're talking about like stuff like your case and and others that have happened where people have been canceled say stupid things, tweet dumb yeah. things, wh- whatever it is. And I've been canceled because of it. Yeah, I think difficult conversations are so important. And we could have had those difficult conversations on camera or with the network. And I think that's just how people get better and learn is through those difficult conversations and teachable moments. Right. I mean, it's like, I always go back to the the narrative, you have to choose your heart. And it's hard to have these conversations and maybe some tears are shed. Maybe people say some things that you don't agree with or, or that they may be right or wrong about, or that create some sort of emotion. But most of the time after those hard conversations, a lot of people are like, man, I'm so thankful that I had this. Like we feel so much better. We feel so much more closer as a result of it. Think about like what happened between you and Stassi. You guys became closer in that moment as a result of having a hard conversation. And on the flip side of that, it's also hard to not have these conversations. And then you look back and you're like, man, I wish I would have like had that conversation because you see that play out throughout your life where now you're mortified and terrified of having difficult conversations because you just automatically think that when you have that difficult conversation. Yeah, the fear of rejection, the fear of being shut down, the fear of not having a voice anymore. Like, what do I do with that? My whole life has been you know, entertaining, building brands. Like I love the reason I feel like part of being such an empath is like, and it's like a social butterfly. I love connecting with people. And that's what the platform of that show like allowed me to do through different companies that I've had and ventures and whatnot, but, and social media, like all in all, it just allows me to connect with people. And I think that's the most important thing for me in this entire world is like human connectivity. Right. Absolutely. I mean, without connection, we're we're really nothing. Like we're meant to be in community of people and you have to continue to put yourself out there to surround yourself with people that not only are bringing the best out of you, which I often say, but people that see differently than you. So that way you can learn and grow just from hearing. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am like the, I am the girl that does not like yes friends. Like I do not want friends to just be like, yeah, you're right. He sucks or they suck or no. Yes. If you agree with me, great. But if not, like show me the other side of it because it might just be something that I'm blind to because of my upbringing, because of what I've been through in life. We've all been, we all have different past lives that we've lived. And I just think you never know what someone has been through until you ask. And if you can learn from everyone that you meet or everyone you become close with, like as a world, we're going to be just such a better place. And that may be another thing that people don't realize about me. Like I want constructive criticism. I want to learn. I want to know more about everybody and what they've been through. So it can maybe open my eyes even bigger than they already are. It seems just from talking about this and learning about it, that has obviously been very painful and traumatic for you. I also would guess there's been some good things that have come out of it. What have been a couple unexpected blessings that have come from these last few years? I mean, a lot of self-reflection. That's for sure. I think I feel that I'm a pretty self-aware person, but there's no ceiling to that. You know, there's always room to grow and to learn. And I think it's just a shit ton of self-reflection. Also, you know, just making sure I'm not ever victimizing myself and really it's kind of just broadening, like all the things that I already know and love about myself, the empath in me, the loyal, the openness, but like just on a such a bigger spectrum than I think would have happened. And also, I mean, the toxicity of not being on that show has been really good for my soul. Yeah, I bet it's like bittersweet, though. I mean, just not being on the show and not being caught up in the drama and having to portray a personality that's not you and everything else that goes along with that. Yeah. It's what I've grown from. And, you know, they weren't willing to see Kristen 
single Kristen growing Kristen with businesses. It was like, but if you could like go cry in a bathroom and do some shots and like fall on your face, like that would be really good TV. <laughs> And it's like, well, I'm 39 now. It's not really, you know, the life that I live anymore. So I think that's also just a blessing is maybe it's just, it was a blessing in disguise. Something that took me a really long time to see that I don't have to be a part of that toxicity anymore. Or pretend to be someone I'm not. Drama sells, right? And so now they're in the midst of filming another season. I know you were recently kind of on the outside of that, like you were at a wedding and they were filming what was going through your mind? What was going through your soul? Like, what, what were some of the feelings that came up for you as somebody? Like you said, you're grateful that you're not like caught up in that in that moment. But what was going on like emotionally for you when you're like right there seeing that? Oh, God. I will say the first sort of wedding event that I attended, which was not being filmed, I kind of came after the cameras were already gone, but I immediately saw a, a couple crew members that I worked with for my entire career on that show. And I did not realize like how emotional that was going to be like painstaking, just, you know, when you're not sobbing but the tears, just don't stop. They're just falling down your face. It was like that seeing the crew who I haven't seen in two years, you know, since pre pandemic. So that was the most emotional part for me was seeing the crew for sure. Staying away from the filming was not hard. I've said this before on my friend Katie's podcast, but it's it's not the same show that I was on. So I did get to sort of see that in real life, even though it was still hard. Those are my friends. That is the crew I worked with. It wasn't the easiest thing, but it just isn't the show that I was on. So that made it a little bit easier, but I would say mostly just sort of having to avoid my friends when I'm at this wedding (laughs) and, you know, because they're doing their job and I have respect for the job that they have to do and the job that the crew has to do. Right. But it was pretty emotional. So with all that to say, are you still pretty tight with most of the crew? Like how has that all played out? Yeah. With the cast or the actual crew? Are you still tight with the well, cast? My, like my like the girl? Yeah. 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 Friends. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm friends with everybody and we hang out on a regular basis. My friend Katie, actually we're both single now and we live in the same apartment complex. <laughs> in our same neighborhood down the street from the houses that we both sold. (laughs) But yeah, I'm with a lot, talk to them daily, all of them that I was always friends with. So at least that's nice. And I know that they're about to wrap, you know, principal photography for this. So then we'll get to spend more time together. Sweet. That's cool that you've been able to not just stay in touch with them, but maintain those friendships and relationships, because I can imagine with all the emotions that are wrapped up in it, it can be challenging at times. I want to go back though to when you got canceled and kicked off Vanderpump and your drop from brands. I'm sure people really didn't want to work with you like you said at that time. But before that, like you said, it was like a decade of you being in this machine where everything was handled for you. You were on a very popular show. You're in the entertainment industry. You have everybody like handling stuff for you. You got brands that you have deals with. Like what were some of the the few things maybe if you could think of a couple things that you had to actually like learn to do for yourself that you'd never had to do before that you think the audience might relate to? I mean, I will say I'm very grateful and lucky even that my team did not drop me. So not to sound like some Hollywoody, whatever, but, you know, I do have a manager and I have a lawyer and I have a publicist and, you know, a friend of mine did get dropped by her publicist. And that was kind of the most terrifying thing was thinking these people are my family and they know me better than anybody. And like, I don't even know what I would do if they had to denounce me or not work with me. So I was very grateful that I still had them. I think the frustrating part and the scary part was just, 2019, I felt like was my year. I was single. I bought a house by myself. I wrote my book, you know, got a publisher to pick up my book. My wine line was going well. My clothing line was going well. I just finally felt like, oh my God, all this work I've done on myself, the universe is finally like giving back to me because I'm grateful to the universe. I'm showing all my gratitude and it's now coming back tenfold. And then it was just like five, four, three, two, one. The world is in a pandemic. So, that first and foremost, just for everybody, was really mentally and emotionally challenging and then getting canceled. And it was just kind of like, what do I do? You know, that whole like, just be quiet, sit still sort of a thing. No one's really, it was always this like, no one's really working right now anyway because of the pandemic. Okay, fine. That could work for like a month or two. But then what? So it was really... 
it wasn't like, I mean, I'm very self-sufficient, so it wasn't really figuring out like how to do things. It was just figuring out what I could do, being that my space was in, you know, branding and marketing myself and entertaining. And those things were, nobody wanted to hear from me regarding any of that. I'm sure you felt stuck in a way because like you mentioned, you were self-sufficient. You just written this book, you bought this house and you did well for yourself and you knew you could probably, if you wanted to make a move, but it's like walking on eggshells. Like you don't know if you, if you make that move, are the shells going to completely crack? Or are you going to be able to tiptoe along them and kind of just move slowly, but surely along that path. And with that said, you talked about you kind of fell into this funk, which rightfully so, I mean, I completely understand for a few weeks, became depressed, fell into some bad habits. But then you talked about how you kind of, you got out of that. So like, how long did it take, would you say, to kind of get back to some level of like baseline, like, yeah, normalcy mentally and emotionally? And what were like some of the, like, what were a few things that you think really helped you be able to do that? I mean, yeah, I would say I had a lot of really bad, like toxic, like go to's for a good three, I want to say about three weeks, maybe a month or so until I was like, this isn't me and this isn't the life that I want for myself. And I'm really, I'm only hurting myself because nobody even knows that, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is me, myself, and I just sort of not living anymore. Like I essentially was not like living my life because I couldn't get out of bed and, you know, I'm thinking now my, I'm empathetic to my dogs. Like, is my energy too bad for them? I should have, you know, their dad, like my ex-boyfriend, like come pick them up. I should just be alone in this world. And it was a lot of just spiraling down a rabbit hole of self-doubt. And I don't know. I mean, it was definitely talking to my family and stuff. My mom has always had this rule through breakups. When you go through a bad breakup, you get 48 hours to like lay on the couch and cry about it. And then you, that's all you get. And so when it came to this, I was like, mom, I need more than 48 hours. And she's like, okay, you can have more than 48 hours, but you can't live in this space. You just can't live in this space of like depression because you have a whole life to live. And, you know, although we can't see why this happened, things happen for a reason. I do believe in the universe and the spirituality of that. I don't know if I necessarily know those answers still, but I was able to pick myself up. But it was, yeah, it was with a lot of therapy and A lot of just, again, during the pandemic, but just being outside and going for walks and just literally not allowing myself to live in the space of rock bottom, even though I had felt I hit it. Right. Because I think what happens, and I know this is like a little bit different than what happened with you, but if somebody has a bad day, it's not really the bad day that you know, brings them down. It's the bad days and weeks that follow based on how they respond to that bad day that ends up impacting their life in a negative way. So I really like your mom's advice to you and that, all right, like it's okay to process these emotions, but you can't stay there. Like it's not going to help yeah, you. You can't stay there forever because the only person you're hurting is yourself. Right. What were a couple of things that have helped you now rebuild your self-confidence, rebuild your self-esteem? Because you know, it seems like you were in a place where you were just getting flat out rejected by everything in your life from a personal and professional level. Yeah. I mean, I would say the last two years have been a bit of a doozy because I think that I did get myself out of it a bit. I was, I'm still working through the trauma for sure. But at the time I felt I had a pretty good support system. And then I just went through a breakup recently after I sold my house and moved into my boyfriend's house. And now I'm in this apartment and I feel like it almost just makes me laugh because I'm like, all right, nothing can get worse at this point. Like, this is it. There's a reason that I'm here in this moment, in this life. There's a reason I'm in this apartment by myself again. It's kind of like, all right, we get to start over. You know, me and my dogs, like we get to start over again. There can only be great things on the other side of this now. And I think I'm moving a little slowly and, putting things back on social media or like, I don't know, just kind of like pushing my brands on people and things like that. I think just my confidence, I still need to build, but I don't know. I started doing like funny TikToks with, you know, my best friend and working out with a trainer, which I, my my friend Megan, which I realized was far more mental than it ever was physical for me. 
I mean, at first I was like, well, I want to be hot and skinny. And if I'm hot and skinny and fit, I'll, if I look better, I'll feel better. And after, you know, my first couple of sessions, I'm like, no, this is the best therapy for my actual brain and for my emotions. So just kind of doing things for myself that are much more positive and like getting up, you know, early in the morning and going on long walks with my dogs and honestly too, kind of closing my social circle a bit. I love everybody. I want to be friends with everybody, but I don't think I need 30 opinions about every decision that I'm going to make. And I'm sort of learning that I don't need to spill, you know, every thought that's in my head to every single one of my friends and get a lot of unsolicited advice when I just need a listener. So really just, I think just really working on my sense of self again and getting that back after the last two years. Right. Cause it seems that it's been this emotional roller coaster over the last couple of years with being canceled. And then you're in that relationship, which kind of helped you out a bit. And then a couple months ago, you go through this breakup and now it, it might bring back some some old feelings, some old thoughts, and you're kind of having to to rework some things emotionally and, and figure out more ways to love yourself and take care of yourself and build, rebuild your confidence. And I think it's just going to be this. I mean, after the, after being canceled and my ex-boyfriend and I, like, you know, he stuck by me through the cancel situation and everything I was going through. And that, that spoke volumes to me. But when we didn't end up working out, it kind of felt like, another like failure rock bottom for just a minute. It was like, well, wait, we had plans. We were getting married. We're going to have a baby. Like this is what we've been working on. I've done everything you've sort of asked me to do to prove that I am a hard worker and, and I, and I got this and I can rebuild myself. And then for that to end, it was just like, Oh man, what's next. <laughs> um, but yeah, luckily that, that rock bottom only lasted a hot minute. So I'm a lot more optimistic than I was a couple of years ago. <laughs> so how has everything that you've been through the last couple of years being canceled, having your, you know, your life essentially shattered in a moment, like how has that impacted now you're single? How has that impacted dating? Like, are there thoughts as far as fear of rejection? Is it like, are you afraid of what somebody's going to read online? Like, what are some of the things that go through your mind now when you're looking to potentially meet somebody new in the future? Oh God, when I've been on very few dates and the hardest part is when you get that question, like, what do you do for a living? What do you do? It's a loaded question. Do I talk about the show I was on, even though I'm not on it anymore? Am I just like, oh yeah, I'm an author and I have a clothing line. And then they see my social media and then it's like, well, why do you have so many followers? Okay, now I'm going to Google you. What are they going to read? Do I have to explain it at all? Do I, how do I explain it sort of without over explaining it? And yeah, especially for me, I've typically, in the 15 years I've been in LA, I'm either dating people I work with or dating friends of friends, which hasn't really worked out for me in the past. So I'm trying to go like a new person type route for my future, but that's really scary because I, I still don't really know how to explain it. And then on the other side of that, I feel like if someone doesn't want to be with me because of whatever they're going to read, rather than, you know, getting to know me, then they're not the right person anyway. It's kind of how I felt when I was on Vanderpump and single. It was like scary because you don't want to date someone who only wants to be with you because you're on a show. But you also don't want to date someone who refuses to be with you because you're on a show. So it's still kind of that narrative for me, but I just keep trying to remind myself that, you know, if it's a good enough dude, like it won't matter because they'll just want to get to know me. Well, so if you're meeting people recently through like people, you know, or friends of friends, don't they know your story already? Yeah, but I tried to jump on a dating app a couple of months ago and I've gone on a couple of dates since that and that yeah and not, none of the two guys I went out with they didn't know me they didn't know my name they didn't know the show but then it's just this weird loaded thing and then you know when they see the social media then they definitely google and then I feel like I have to give some sort of explanation and it's just really tricky but I, I don't feel I've been judged thus far but it's still like really tricky like how do you not sound like a self-involved douchebag being like well I was on this show <laughs> that I'm not anymore so why even bring it up well because I've in a way, it still sort of defines me. And that's your reality. Like, that's your truth, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong with, like, to me as a guy, like, I would almost appreciate more. And I know, like, there's some people that are like, you shouldn't, like, spill all your tea, like, 
the first date, but something like this, like being transparent and upfront, like I would appreciate it and respect it more because I'd be like, oh, like this person like owns their shit. Like this person. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm approaching it kind of like Eminem and like the last rap battle in <laughs> yeah. eight mile where he's like, I'm about to tell you everything you're going to say against me. So you have nothing left to like throw a curveball, you know, like there's no curveball left for you. Here it all is very simply and, you know, take it or don't. Let's not waste each other's time. <laughs> I think you should bring a mic with you on your next one and like do that. And then like walk, like walk away. I'm like, I'm going to the bathroom and then like drop the mic. And then like, when you come back, see if he's still there, then you'll know like if he's really totally. interested or not, <laughs> you know, you talked about how it's an awkward question you get when people are like, all right, so what do you do? Because right now you're kind of in limbo with a few things, but like, let's just say you're looking into the future a year from now, two years from now, what is it? that you would hope you are doing in the next few years? I would love to do another show for sure. I would like to have a little more control. I would like it to be a little bit more of a docu-series type, break the fourth wall, that kind of thing. I mean, I think that as an ensemble cast, you know, even if it weren't all of us, I just think, I think there's still interest. And I think that we're really good at that. And I think we are funny and interesting and, and I think especially now as adults, like much more adult than we were on Vanderpump, like we do have a lot to say and we are given a platform with a lot to say. Definitely still have my clothing line, definitely want to bring the wine line back at some point. And I would love to adapt my book to television or film, something that we were working on, my co-author and I, when all of this went down. So that has been put on pause I would probably write another book. It really, that was the greatest accomplishment of my life. The most vulnerable I've ever been and the most fun I've ever had. So I want to do a podcast. I've been working on something. I just, I have a voice that I just think like <laughs> to sound like a dick. I just, I think people need to hear my voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good thing too. I think it's important to own your voice, speak your truth, and and then like find a way to convey that like to the masses. And I think speaking of that, a theme, I guess, of one of the themes of the conversation has been that a lot of people might misunderstand who you are and that didn't that they didn't get a chance to see a lot of the good sides of you. So just imagine that you're in a coffee shop and you run into like a group full of people that were fans of the show, fans of you. Maybe they're not fans of you, but you had 30 seconds with them to tell them like what you feel, what's most misunderstood about you. What would you say? I think the things that bother me the most is that I'm a mean girl, that I'm not loyal because I'm completely the opposite of those things. That I do care a lot, that I essentially do more for my friends than I ever do for myself, that I just care about people in general, that I want kindness for this entire world, that nothing makes me happier than when people are kind and they give. And, you know, I just think hugs and love and kindness will literally heal this world. That's really well said. And I think there's nothing worse than like being misunderstood by somebody and people judging a book by its cover without taking time to read the pages, right? Because I think we all have a story. And that's why I wanted to get you on here to to share yours. So Christian, this has been awesome. I think people are really going to appreciate the conversation and they're going to want to connect with you and, and learn more about like, not just what you've done, but like what you're doing moving forward. So where's the best place for people to follow you? Thank you for like giving me this platform and being so kind and like being interested and, in, you know, our awesome long, long talk yesterday and this, and you know, it's, I feel like I've been really scared to like even address this. And this is definitely like the kindest and best like we said earlier, therapeutic sort of platform for me to be able to like shed that weight a bit. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. So if people want to follow you on social media, if they want to connect with you, where's the best place for them to do that? On um, Instagram at Kristen Doty and follow me on TikTok because I'm new at it and it's really fun. And Doug, you and I have like done like a duet together. We're probably going to do another one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just at Kristen Doty and jamesmay.co is my clothing line. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link all that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, I invite you to share like a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Kristen shared 
about her journey into reality television, maybe it was something that she said about being canceled, what that was like, her comeback story, how it's impacted her, what she's doing to prepare herself for the future, like whatever it was, tag Kristen and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and we'll see you next time.